All right, so the other, the other one again that I talked about that's very highly uh, triggered is the cardiorespiratory. It's, um, these are the things that make a difference. The, the congestive heart failure, pneumonia, and COPD. We can make a huge difference in these three things, and a lot of people in residential aged care have this organ failure. Okay? The thing that people die from with dementia, as you all know who work in the facilities, is pneumonia. So if we can, and in fact, as, as people get closer to death with dementia, that recurrent uh, chest infection is kind of an indicator of that impending death. So if we can keep an eye on this uh, closely and do interventions, we can make a massive difference in uh, quality of care. So what are the signs and symptoms? So this is just a, an example of, of something that we could work with the nurses on, and even actually the HCAs. But for instance, it, to the nurses understand that once you get into the grade threes and fours, the mean survival is one year. We are looking at end of life. We are looking at that end congestive heart failure stage is really tricky and needs a lot of analysis. So that's where we can kind of heighten their idea about it isn't just about recording data, it's about looking at that data and thinking what does this mean for this person. Now, uh, so for instance, given another example, heart failure fluid overload. So this would be your, so my goal is to decrease exacerbations of congestive heart failure. That's my goal. My evidence would be orthopnea, you know, laying down and getting short of breath, edema, JVB, JVP. But for me, this weight gain, that's something that the resident can keep track of. That's something that the HCA can keep track of, and sometimes the family can help us with that as well. So it's something that's very simple that makes a humongous difference, is keeping track of that weight. Uh, respiratory distress as well, and shortness of breath. Again, the HCAs can really be helpful with this um, as well. Anxiety is just part of that, is uh, part of the fluid overload and poor appetite. So this is what we can do. This would be an intervention weigh daily uh, and then within parameters if they gain two kilos in, a, in two or three days please let the RN and the prescriber know. Um, change positions, elevate the feet, um, the nurse can assess the lung sounds. This is something I had a, I had a family tell me this the other day and it was really interesting because it made me really think. So I was, I was having a very long advanced care planning discussion with this family there had been an incident that could have probably been handled a little bit differently and a little bit better. And uh, we were having this discussion and I put my stethoscope on the, on the table that we were having this discussion. I didn't even think about it, I just kind of, because I took it around my neck and put it on the table. And they said, you know, I don't see any other nurses have those stethoscopes. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that, but it's true. So how do we upskill the nurses so that they do more comprehensive assessments and put those pieces together, because that actually makes their job more meaningful as well. They, you know, if they're critically thinking all the time, their job becomes more meaningful. Um, so consult, consultation with a dietitian, they can't eat as much, so do it, um, and then medication adjustments. But what I try to do, what we can do as a team, is I can say, now I want you to do these labs, and if, they're, if their creatinine gets to a certain pla place, please let me know and we can take a look at things, like if I've increased their fruit or something. So this is just another example of six months of life, patients with congestive heart failure. They have pain, confusion, and um, dyspnea. Actually, they have about the same level of pain, confusion, of dyspnea in the last end stage as somebody with cancer. We just finished a study called the Elder Study. We're just about ready to publish it. And one of the things that we found is we looked at uh, the quality of death up and down New Zealand, some of you were involved in that study, and we looked at uh, in residential aged care, and what we found is that last week of life, it didn't matter what your underlying diagnosis was, cancer, dementia, or organ failure, you had the same level of symptoms. It is, death is death in palliative care. But what we did also find is that if you looked a month before that person died, people with dementia had more symptoms of distress than people with cancer or people with organ failure. And that's actually quite, I don't think we've put that together. 
that, that, that people with dementia actually are, have a lot more care that's needed before death than people with cancer or people with organ failure. So it was quite interesting. The other thing, again, to talk as a, as a team about is this person palliative, you know, has this person become more of a palliative kind of situation? One of the most important advanced care planning uh, questions for any of us, and the, again, those of us that work in residential age care know this, is, is this person for hospitalization? And if they are, what do we hope to get from the hospital? So that's where it's a really great discussion to have with the resident, or if they can do it, or if the, with the family. Um, again, this situation where we had this um, gentleman was having chest pain, but he also had uh, cancer, he had metastases, right? So the chest pain was actually probably from the metastases, but he, he also had heart problems, but he came to us for palliation so, and he was, he was fairly new to us. So there was a, a lack of kind of thinking this through as in this might be more of a palliative cancer issue than cardiac sent to hospital anyway. And that was, you know what I'm saying? That was just was not, it was one of those situations that, no, we should have thought this, what did you think the hospital was going to do? Because the hospital then sent him back within 12 hours as you can imagine, because what, we're not going to cure this man. So I think having families understand that. We know that, um, we know that when a family sits down with, a, with, a, with me or with anybody and has a really good advanced care planning discussion, they relax. If they know that that care plan is in place, and that's why, where we had this very long care planning discussion, and they know that we're working as a team and they, they can go, that's all right. So he has chest pain, that's part of the process. Understanding when somebody can get closer to uh, end of life. So for instance, poor renal function, they, get, they start to lose weight, their sodium is really hard to, to keep uh, together because of all the uh, fluid overload and the hypotension where they used to be hypertensive all those years, now they're hypotensive. So this is a really important thing for us to kind of think about as far as our care planning. So where are we in this process? There are people with congestive heart failure who going to hospital and doing two or three days of frusamide is the best thing ever. That is the best thing for them because they're gonna be with us for another year and that's great because that just, sometimes they get so fluid overloaded that no matter how many oral medicines we give them, it doesn't absorb well in a, in a gut that's got ascites in it. So sending them to hospital some, for some IV furosemide works great. So it just depends on where we are with this person. So COPD is the same kind of issue. So what indicates whether they're getting at the end of life, um, the FEV1, which sometimes we have and sometimes we don't, but they have these exacerbations. And for us, that's an important thing. They have weight loss, long-term therapy, uh, oxygen therapy, they have evidence of core pulmonale. Those kinds of things would be important to talk with the families about. CO people with COPD also have pain. Um, we think it's probably from the hypoxia from the respiratory, the, the work that they have to do to get that, that uh, air in. And, but there are things that we can think about for a care plan. So the, care, so the goal is to decrease the distress from the, the, the um, shortness of breath. Okay, so that's the goal. The intervention, so the assessment is what works for this guy, you know, or this woman. What is one of the things that really, and again, you can talk to the resident, you can talk to the family, you can talk to the uh, HCAs, the other nurses, what really works for this person. Then you want to translate that into, we'll have, uh, like for instance, one of the things that I often do with people with COPD is just a little bit of, uh, like morphine, five milligrams of morphine twice a day can actually really decrease that centralized feeling of uh, congested, uh, sorry, of um, shortness of breath. Or a fan, amazingly, I don't know what it is about fans and COPD, but having the window open and fans can make a massive just comfort difference for that person. Positioning can make a big difference. So again, it's just, that, that's the whole idea. Here's the goal, here's what we know about this gentleman, and this is what we're gonna try. 
And then the real important thing is to go back and see if that's helped. So um, the other thing that can also be helpful is to know when your patient is ill. It seems simple, it seems straightforward, but it actually isn't always straightforward. So one of the, for me, that I, I talk with the, the nurses that I work with and also families, for me with somebody with, that I'm worried about having a pneumonia, temperature, yes or no, may or may not go up. You know, older people don't get fevers very easy. It's the respiration rate. For me, the respiration rate is the big thing. So if I can say to, if we can look at our care plans and say, we're gonna decrease the incidences of pneumonia, this is what we know about this person. They don't get a fever very often. But what they do is their normal baseline respiration rate is 24. So if that respiration rate goes up to 28, we're gonna call the nurse practitioner, we're gonna call the GP. And then of course, the other thing that's a real key is rather than fever is cognition you know, that where their behavior changes. Shortness of breath, again, we talked about a lot of this, the same kind of idea. Our plan is, our goal is to decrease the shortness of breath. We know that for this person, the other thing for people that are end stage COPD, I don't care how much oxygen they use. <laughs> they, you know, may or may not help them, I don't really care. If they feel like it helps them, it's palliative to me. So, you know, I just don't have a lot of problem using uh, oxygen. It's different in the community, I realize, but in residential aged care, they have COPD and they're end stage, uh, and it makes, oxygen makes them feel better, fine. Um, so again, the interventions would be things like monitoring respiratory status, uh, temperature, um, pain, uh, weight, and nutrition status, particularly with people with COPD. Incontinence also came up as one of the top caps for us to kind of think about. And of course, the first thing we always think about with incontinence is do they have a urinary tract infection? That's the very first thing. Um, of course, one of the tricky parts about that is we've kind of gotten good at thinking about rest, uh, urinary tract infections, but then we're doing a lot of dipsticks, and dipsticks are not as sensitive as an MSU. So I, unless it's really obvious, I'll usually try to wait for the MSU. And I think, again, as a team, if we understand that, um, what I've seen more and more at the teams that I work with is they'll send the MSU quite quickly and increase the fluids. So that's the, you know, both of those need to go together is the increasing the fluids and, and um, uh, checking, uh, doing the MSU. Now, of course, there's a million different things. This is just an example. This is an idea of if you had some guidance so that you as a team could go to that guidance and say, you know, is this, is this stress incontinence, is urge incontinence, is it, you know, to have a discussion um, as far as what is the problem and then what can be done about it. So for instance, there's a lot of people with incontinence because they can't move around, right? Because their mobilities or because of cognitive problems. So that scheduled toileting can be a massive thing, can really, really be helpful. So potentially reversible conditions we need to think about is as part of the care planning, make sure their bowels are open. Uh, depression, urinary tract infection, congestive heart failure can be part of that, drug side effects. Um, so there can be uh, lots of things that we can think about as interventions for this person, but we have to get to know the person. Uh, one of the things that's hard for us in residential aged care is more than anything is that transition period. And we're getting, one of the things that we found from elder study is that the median length of stay for somebody with dementia was 15 months. The median length of stay for somebody with organ failure was 17 months. The median length of stay for somebody with cancer was one month. That is really hard for us because they're usually coming at us with huge functional issues. That's why they need residential aged care. They're not with us very long. We don't know them very well. And that is a huge, that transition time is one of the hardest things for us in residential aged care. Um, so doing that assessment quickly is often quite a challenge. So this is some other things to kind of think about. Again, we talked about the depression rating scale. It's a subscale. Um, I find this making negative statements um, uh, there's, a, there's a poor self-esteem that sometimes happens, wh even with people with m moderate to severe dementia. They start saying these really 
kind of self-degrading things, and it's always a key to me uh, to think about depression. Um, the other thing to, that I think is interesting is that we often, I think there's a perception possibly that people in residential aged care are a lot more depressed than people in home care, and actually they're not that much, you know. The other thing we have to put into this is they, the reason you're in residential aged care is because you're pretty frail. And so are you, up, you know, are you not feeling so good about things because you're frail, or are you not feeling so good about things because you're in residential aged care? Um, so there's, you know, what can we do about depression? It's a really huge issue for older people. There's some things that we can do. There's so a Cochrane review of six randomized controlled studies um, looked at non-pharmacological interventions. Uh, there were some good things about it. Uh, one of the things we don't do well in New Zealand, which I'd love to see better, is I want a social worker in every facility. I want a social worker who does about four or five facilities who can do um, mild depression, who can do the counseling that can actually really help people with anxiety and depression. The other things that we can do is uh, exercise can make a huge difference, you know, getting people out of their room, getting people to, ex to even just walk down the hall. It is important for us to think about non-pharmacological uh, treatments. However, the question is, do you treat with pharmacological interventions or not? What's interesting in this study is that they found that when they used uh, SSRI, like a citalopram, um, they, it did decrease symptoms, but after 13 to 39 weeks, there was no difference from controls, but still, I, I tend to fall on the yes, less treat. Particularly, I have a, a real affinity for mirtazapine, seems to work really well. Um, so I tend to treat, because even if, you know, 39 weeks is, it's better than nothing. It's six months of feeling better. You know, that's better. The problem, of course, is that all medicines have side effects. So there are these types of, we use citalopram, citalopram is a, a real common one for older people's health. But we know, one of the things that we thought when the SSRIs came out, that we wouldn't have as many falls with the, with the antidepressants as we did with the TCIs. Uh, the TCA, excuse me, but unfortunately it turned out that there's just as many falls, or not quite as many, but there's, as, there's they also increase falls with SSRIs. Now the question is, what's that from? Uh, it could be hypo hyponatremia, that's one of the things that could be a side effect. It could be that there's a, a QT uh, interval prolongation, which, so that's a problem. So we don't know exactly why this is. Uh, maybe that when you're depressed, you just fall more. I mean, so that's another thing as well. The other thing that's important for us to consider and to think about is that there is a correlation between depression and dementia so that we know that uh, people with uh, dementia uh, have a higher incidence of depression in their life prior to their dementia. Okay, so there, so again, I'm, I'm quite, uh, have a low threshold for treating people for depression. Now I talk real briefly about uh, the CHESS scale. The CHESS scale uh, is important for us to understand this scale because I think it's misunderstood at times. One of the things that's important about this is that it detects frailty and health instability. Um, and this is, it's designed to identify persons at risk of serious decline. It was not designed to identify people that are gonna die. Okay, so that's, a, I think, important. So it's all of these things, dyspnea, vomiting, you know, these guys are sick. Basically, it's a way to detect who's, who's had a decline. There's a zero to five scale. So it does actually medical complexity um, and health instability. Now, what's interesting, and this has been quite interesting, this is the home care assessments. These are the long-term care assessments from InterI in New Zealand. This was uh, two years ago. And what you see is that there is higher chest scores in home care than there was in long-term care. This was quite a surprise. We didn't expect this. Um, so one of the things about this that's quite interesting is that we also did some work uh, the last few years where we looked at hospitalization before people go into residentialized care and after they go into residentialized care. The six months before people go into residentialized care, their hospitalization goes up exponentially. And then once they go into residential aged care, their hospitalization drops to a level that was below what it was in the, in the community. 
And a lot of that is because they're frail. They're getting the 24-hour care that is sometimes required for people that are really quite frail. So I think this was quite an eye-opener to a lot of us. It was quite interesting. This is just uh, some work done to Don Hurdy's. Um, this is uh, the chest scale and mortality. So certainly if you're sick, you have a higher mortality. But I think this was misinterpreted as chest telling us about mortality. It's actually about change in condition. 